Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on April 3rd. Just a reminder, this is all in the realism overall set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. There was a lot to get done in this particular episode. We had a lot of interplanetary probes that needed mid-course adjustments, but the first thing was to resupply the Mars Cycler test, which was currently in orbit around the Earth. And to do that, we needed to send it much more oxygen. It was fine for food and water, just needed a lot of oxygen. So here I'm rebuilding the lunar resupply probe and turning it into a cycler resupply probe and loading it onto a Falcon 9 rocket instead of what the lunar resupply used, which is a Falcon Heavy. For the launch, I'm using my KOS script, which is very reliable for the Falcon 9. And we start at T plus zero, so I don't have to cut it short. It does depend on launching at T plus zero, so. Now, it does seem to have a little problem with a uh, roll issue, and that's actually because I failed to put the correct pad orientation. Apparently, the probe uh, was at a different heading than the script expected. There's a line that I have to change to compensate for that at the top of the script. Anyway. Everything else looks fine, and eventually it's dampening out the oscillations, so that's good. Here we go, about halfway through the first stage. And getting ready for first stage separation. First stage set, and ignition of the second stage. I'm occasionally worried about the KOS script on the second stage ignition because um, if the fuel is unsettled, if it doesn't do the second stage ignition quickly enough, the fuel might get unsettled. And sometimes it has some weird delays in igniting the second stage. But no problems here. Physical time warp to get through it as quickly as possible. Second stage burn is a pretty long burn. Not as long as other upper stages sometimes. Everything's still in the hands of the KOS script. It's decided to pitch up a bit. Now it's flattened out. That's all based on computations that I have it doing. Uh, might not be the best computations ever, but anyway, it gets it to orbit. Not, not quite the apoapsis and periapsis I actually assign it to, but since it works, I'm loath to tinker with it too much right now. It's more important that it works. I, I, frankly, uh, most of the time the orbit that I want it in is arbitrary anyway. As long as it's actually in orbit, I can figure out the rest. Alright, so here I'm spinning around the whole thing because I want to deorbit the second stage. But the second stage doesn't have any RCS to stabilize the fuel. So I'm actually using the RCS on the probe, on the uh, supply vessel, in order to spin it around and thereby sell the fuel, and you see the fuel is very stable, then I let go of the second stage. We move away from the second stage, then I switch to the second stage, see that's very stable as it's still turning around and around, and now aimed at the retrograde vector, I light the engine, and it is deorbited. But yeah, for some reason, uh, I don't have the nitrogen thrusters that the second stage is supposed to have. The real Falcon 9 second stage has little RCS thrusters to orient itself. Rendezvousing with the station, you can see it at 7.4 kilometers there. Using a lot of fuel here because we happen to have a lot of fuel, so I'm just being a little bit wasteful about it. This is the cycler, just in case you forgot. It's got that red tug at the end. That's not technically part of the cycler. And now approaching to dock. We're gonna have to remove these, the tug and this supply vessel before we can use this for other things. I plan to send the cycler over to Mars actually. I think it would be a good idea to not make it a Mars cycler on this one. We might have to do some fixes to make it a proper Mars cycler, especially its own thrusters do not work. But uh, maybe make it a Mars station. So that would be a good thing to have. Alright, anyway, all docked up, so we're ready to go for our interplanetary missions. I'm checking the life support there, and we do have enough. So now, here with Jupiter Probe Beta, and we need to do its mid-course adjustment to figure out 
how it's going to approach the Jupiter system. And you can see my initial inclination is to get really close to Jupiter because it's fairly easy to make orbit around Jupiter. I've got about 6,500 meters per second there. 6,632 Mechjeb says down there. And you can see it's only going to take about 1,200 to get into a loose orbit around Jupiter once we uh, get close to Jupiter. However, if we're going to get into orbit around one of Jupiter's moons, then we have to lift that orbit all the way back up again right in order to circularize at the moon's own orbit and that costs a lot so I see what happens if we start out at Io's orbit and how much I'll take to circularize it still seems to be too much for this particular probe I really have my heart set on Europa anyway so I decide to see what happens if we aim at Europa's orbit initially instead of getting close to Jupiter and then circularizing at that orbit to get a sense of how much it's going to cost to get into orbit around Europa. And I decide that there is enough fuel for that, or at least we might as well try it. So I do this burn. Now we have control issues on this stage because the Vinci engines are not gimbling. And you can see we're very far away from the maneuver node or anything. Yeah, it's really bad. And uh, we don't have any ignitions on the little Ullage rockets anymore. They had limited ignitions of four. So, yeah, anyway, continuing to try and use the Vinci engine to do what it's supposed to do and bring us to the correct orbit. You can see Io's orbit and then a little bit of thrust to bring us to Europa's orbit. Okay, very good. Now, with Jupiter Probe Gamma, we have a completely different problem. Not a gimbling problem, but a lack of connection problem, which is weird because it has the same dish. And so, why does it have a lack of connection? It's got power, and I checked that the batteries were unlocked. So, I have no idea why Remote Tech has decided that this does not have a connection. It doesn't have a great approach to Jupiter. Um, okay on the altitude above Jupiter, but the inclination is horrible. We really need to flatten that out if we want to hit anything. Here we are with Jupiter Probe Alpha, which was launched way before Beta and Gamma. Beta and Gamma were launched about the same time, in the same window, but this was launched before, so it's actually in Jupiter SOI now. And it's on the tight approach that I initially used, but now I know better that it's not a good idea to have that tight approach. So I start seeing what will happen if I lift it up, should I aim for Io? I'm trying to aim for the moon that is closest that I can still do that I have enough Delta V for because uh, the closer ones are harder apparently. Here I've got a Europa encounter but I don't actually have enough fuel to get into orbit around Europa once I get there so that's a no-go even though that would be really convenient. So yeah, gonna have to try and nix that and see something better. Maybe starting up at Europa's orbit? Nah, it's still too much. I think I checked and I had like 5,600 or something like that meters per second to work with. And this has got to cost 6,400. Ganymede? Well, that's closer. Uh, 272 initially and another 5,600. So maybe Callisto is the answer. I mean, well, of course it's our last option. But first I decide to do this burn. I'm not entirely sure why I did this burn first. Unlocking those, you see 5,697, so yeah, we wouldn't have enough for Ganymede. But I still take care of this chunk, lifting our orbit to, to Ganymede's orbit first. This is the Lunar Module Descent Engine, I believe. Okay, and concluding that burn. Alright. Of course, it would have been much easier if I had gotten all this done at the mid-course plane change instead of in Jupiter's SOI. So here I'm testing out the Callisto theory. We'll need to lift our orbit by about 142 meters per second more than we already have. And... Well, this is a... That's pretty close. Maybe we can get something with Callisto? Let's see. It looks like about 4,600 after we do this burn, so that's not too bad. We'll still have some to spare afterwards. 
Okay, so now 5,278 meters per second remaining, and checking how much it's going to take to match orbits with Callisto again. With a little bit of a normal burn, we seem to get an encounter with Callisto, and that's only costing about 4,500 meters per second or so, leaving us with about 700 meters per second. So that is very good. Now the question is whether getting into orbit around Callisto is going to cost more than 700 after we've matched, roughly matched orbits. And it doesn't. Now uh, we can see there, testing the orbit. Now that's not the orbit I want, I want a polar orbit around Callisto. But let's take a look at how much that costs first. Come on, click away from maneuver node 1. Okay, only 400 or so. This is the adjustment with a polar orbit. Still costing less than 4,500 meters per second initially, and it costs 500 once we get into Callisto SOI. So, yeah, doable. And so this uh, Jupiter Probe Alpha now becomes our Callisto Probe. I checked that our other missions are still well supplied, but we actually have to take care of the Pluto Probe first. It's got its mid-course plane change right now, as we're still on approach to Jupiter. So we're in Jupiter SOI, but it takes a long time to actually get to our Jupiter periapsis. You can see we have a pretty hefty burn with this Pluto probe. Uh, nothing it can't handle. It's got 5,385 meters per second, so it's got 1,700 more than these for this mid-course plane change. But that doesn't leave it very much to actually get into orbit around Pluto as we expend that stage with the two Gemini lander engines. And we use a little one kilonewton thruster now. Taking a look, uh, now using RCS to fine tune the approach to Pluto. I get my first legit Pluto encounter in 31 years. It's uh, going to take 31 years to get there. But that is a Pluto encounter, all right. So we're going to at least do a Pluto flyby. Now, trying to get into orbit, you see we only have 1,200, but we don't have enough to get into orbit. Maybe if we got closer to Pluto it would be easier, but uh, I don't know. Pluto's gravitational influence might not be enough to help us very much. You can see it's taking more than 4,000 to get into orbit. And this is to slow down, right, and to match orbits with Pluto, really. And yeah, estimate about 4,600 for future reference. But anyway, we will at least do a uh, New Horizons thing. And so I queue that up, and it's going to take a while to actually get to that wonderful moment of having a Pluto flyby. Here we have Tomasino's Better Tomorrow's probe, which is aimed at Saturn, and he just wants it in, in any orbit around Saturn. Uh, so we don't have to worry too much about the meeting up with a moon thing, though Titan would be nice. We've got another Titan lander on its way. So basically this is mainly to provide communication support around Saturn. You can see our approach there, and we're going to try and get in tight close to Saturn so that it's easy to get into orbit around Saturn. I don't think we're reading all of our Delta V there. I think there's some locked feel. But still, I think uh, even so, the 1,100 meters per second we see there might be enough to get into orbit around Saturn after this mid-course adjustment. Let's take a look. Yeah, yeah, 976 meters per second, and we've got 1,134 left over. So that looks pretty good. It looks like uh, maybe uh, we could actually do a Titan flyby or something like that with this, too. Who knows? But we'll leave that be for now and bring in our Jupiter probe Alpha for its rendezvous with Callisto. So this is the big burn to get into orbit around Jupiter and to match orbits with Callisto. There's Jupiter. Nice view and everything. This is the first time I've done this kind of high approach to Jupiter in order to get into orbit around it. Okay, so that stage is done. Lunar descent engine off. And looks like five one kilonewton thrusters. Five one kilonewton thrusters active, getting us into a tighter orbit now. And I need to get that approach to Callisto. There it is. Though we're crashing into Callisto right there. That's not quite what I want. 
A little bit of RCS effort should do the trick. At least it's polar, which means we can use our scanner to great effect. Okay. Yep, about 370 kilometers. I don't know if that's low enough at this point, though I find out eventually, of course. But you can see by the curve, because we've so closely matched Callisto's orbit, that's not going to take too much to get into orbit around it. But we're not there yet. We have to go around Jupiter once, a full orbit at Callisto's orbit, before we actually encounter Callisto. So that's going to take a while. And in the meantime, we actually have another Jupiter transfer window. And so I decided to do something else that I haven't ever plotted out before, though I've done it before. I did a Voyager probe once. Uh, matching Voyager's timing, but this time I saw on the map that uh, we could do a slingshot of Jupiter to head to Saturn. And here I'm launching the probe for that on Falcon 9. So this is the first time I've planned out a slingshot around Jupiter to head to one of the other outer planets without using a window that I know works from history, right? So, like Voyager I know works from history. But this time I just looked at the map and saw that it was possible to go from Jupiter to Saturn and decided to go for it. I did not do any particular calculation for it, I just sort of looked on the map and saw the alignments of the planets to judge from that. And I hope to be able to do more of that in the future. It actually might be easier to just eyeball it than calculate it believe it or not. Especially with the larger planets like Saturn and Uranus. And maybe, uh, I'd say Saturn and Uranus. It'll be easier. Uh, Pluto would be a lot harder. Pluto you'd probably have to calculate. Okay, everything's still going well. Waiting for fairing separation. There we go. Fairing set. But it's sort of nice, uh, with this slingshot, we can launch a Saturn probe on a Falcon 9. That's a, that's a nice thing. The question, of course, will be whether this Saturn probe ends up being a flyby, in orbit of Saturn, or in orbit around one of Saturn's moons. That's a trickier sort of question. We'll at least get the flyby, but we would like the orbit. And that doesn't seem to require too much, it'll just take about a thousand meters per second. Well, I don't know about that actually. We'll be going faster at Saturn than the other mission was. The other mission was a Holman transfer, so it wasn't going too fast when it hit Saturn. Anyway, here I am angling to hit Jupiter first, obviously. Make sure that we've got the Jupiter encounter lined up. And then, then aiming for Saturn. And you can see there, I already have a a little indicator of our approach to Saturn and I'm adjusting our initial burn to get closer. With the Jupiter encounter every little tiny adjustment even to the mid-course plane change makes a huge difference when we get to Saturn. You can see that changes of tenths or hundredths of meters per second changes our orbit by millions of kilometers after the Jupiter encounter. Which gives you an idea about the influence of Jupiter. Okay, we have separated the second stage, and I tried the little flip around to see if we could uh, sell the fuel down in the second stage, but by the time I separated it, it already turned unstable, so no luck there. Did not uh, deorbit the second stage that time. Anyway, proceeding with the mission. We've got, obviously got some locked fuel there, otherwise, we wouldn't have enough for. The initial transfer cost six, almost 6,500 to get over to Jupiter. And we only have 4,500 visible, but we have two locked stages. Okay, that's the end of that part. And I actually replot before doing the next bit. Instead of initially going, I think it was because we were deviating by quite a lot, but I do replot and we just needed 2,100 more. And that's well within the capacity of this stage. Now we do have that mid-course adjustment, but this is all hypergolic fuels, storable fuels, so no boil-off issues. Okay, almost done with this burn. Looks like there will be 700 meters per second left in the stage. That should be more than enough for the mid-course adjustment. 
Now, orbit around Saturn, that's a different story. That will be up to the final stage, and I don't remember off the top of my head how much that had. Okay, you can see uh, we've got an iffy encounter with Jupiter right there, so some RCS tuning was required and some tuning of the mid-course adjustment. Mid-course adjustment looks like it costs 350 meters per second out of a possible 650 in this stage. Uh, I saw a Uranus encounter right there, but that was not our plan and it would take a long time. One of the benefits of getting the Jupiter slingshot is we'll be getting to Saturn quicker, I think. So that's nice. There's a Saturn periapsis. The downside of getting to Saturn quicker is it's much harder to slow down. But uh, we'll take that as it comes. This is an interesting experiment in using a Jupiter slingshot, so I will take it. And the next maneuver, the mid-course adjustment, will be in about a year. Now, for some reason, people uh, inquired whether it would be possible to put a single side booster on a Falcon 9 the same way that Atlas V occasionally carries a single SRB. And I thought it was pretty obvious that it was possible, but uh, we tried it anyway. And so here I have a single um, Merlin engine, Merlin 1D, on a booster. And just as the Atlas SRB has it, I did tilt the engine a little bit, uh, similar to the way you have the engines on space shuttles. Um, the, the space shuttle and any other shuttle that you would care to design with the engines on the shuttle side. And we just tried it out. I let the KOS script handle it instead of launching it myself, so it's sort of a legit consistent test. So here we go, a Falcon 9 with a single engine on one side. And it doesn't take me long to conclude that this is going to work just fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, by, by this time I'm absolutely sure I think about just uh, ending the test, I go a little bit further, and then I just conclude, yeah, yeah, it's going to work just fine. That's not that interesting. So then they asked me to uh, launch it with uh, entire Falcon core on one side. And so that's what we have here. Again, I was pretty confident it would work based on the center of mass and center of thrust. And we do have fuel cross-feeding from the side booster into the core. I don't know whether that makes it easier or harder. I suppose close to the end of the burn of the booster, it would make it harder because the balance would be a little bit off. I did not tilt any engines this time. It wasn't necessary. So the engines are all straight. You can see that they are gimbling a lot in order to keep things stable, but, but it's not too bad. And again, the KOS script is in charge. My main question was actually separation rather than anything else. So, a little bit more time. You can see it's working quite smoothly. So, uh, Falcon semi-heavy. Losing its booster. It was a bit of more of violent uh, separation than I thought, but yeah, uh, test successful. Yes, you can strap a single Falcon core on the side of a Falcon 9 and it will still work. Alright, back to our Jupiter probe Alpha, which is now approaching Callisto after going around Jupiter one time. And so now we are going to have to make orbit around Callisto. The first time I've ever made orbit around Callisto, I think. I'm pretty sure about that. And, uh, I, I don't know if I've ever made orbit around any of Jupiter's moons, actually. This might be the first time for that altogether. Yeah, so, quite a momentous occasion. Here we go, looks like it's gonna cost just about as much fuel as we have, conveniently. Uh, that was a close call, actually. It's always nice when things work out so neatly, but, uh... As long as it doesn't work the other way and you're just a few meters per second short. But I didn't know what altitudes I needed to be at to perform the orbital survey. And it looks like 241 kilometers and 1500 kilometers are the bounds. So at apoapsis I need to lift my periapsis. Unfortunately there is an issue with transmitting science in remote tech for 1.0.5. Uh, this has apparently been fixed for 1.1, but not for 1.0.5. There, There is a sort of uh, 
sort of an on-the-fly fix in the forum thread that I use eventually, but for now I wasn't able to do the resource scan. I will try and do that in the next iteration of Soul System Colonization with the fix in place. Alright, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.